would like to introduce to you the main speaker and the guy that did all the work on this, been working for months on this to, to get you the correct information. And that is Mike Gustafson. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, an elected official we have here tonight, Randy Netherland. Maybe Randy, you kind of have to stand up and give us a wave from Mason County. <laughs> if there's another uh, that I've missed, uh, please wave it. Stand up. Marcus? Marcus Hoffman, Commissioner of Southern Water District. Thanks, Marcus. And thank you, Jackie, for the introduction. I was asked to give a thumbnail background sketch. I'm uh, retired from working for the Navy, as many people here also are, and a number of years of active duty in the Naval Reserve. Spent 10 years on the Kitsap County Planning Commission, and uh, with several others who are here tonight. And we argued many strong words with the county over various ordinances that came down the road. Your being here tonight is at the very heart of patriotism and your care about our country. First off, Kitsap Alliance is a nonpartisan organization. Tonight's topic affects every one of us equally. Our founders were given a blank slate when they created our government. They could have written anything they wanted. They chose the English model, the English model of law, of checks and balances, with the exception of, of course, an elected president instead of a king. Our government is based on the rights we now take for granted. They were drafted in the Magna Carta exactly 800 years ago. <coughs> The premise of the Magna Carta was that laws could only be created with the people's consent. Tonight, I'm going to let, it, let you in on some secrets. Today, we have another government that does not play by these rules. This is administrative or agency government. Agencies are a part of the executive branch. They write 90% of our laws, but they strip away most of the legal protections that we were promised in our Constitution's Bill of Rights. In Washington State, we have two sets of laws, the Revised Code of Washington, RCW, and the Washington Administrative Code, the WAC. So what's with two sets of laws? There's no mention of administrative law in our federal or state constitutions. After several years being around the government, we discovered the source of this authority is a set of laws called the Administrative Procedures Acts. The Federal Act, dated 1946, and Washington State followed in 1988 the state's version. They created what we now call the fourth branch of government. Contrary to the wording in the Administrative Procedures Act, the lead sentence in Article 1, Section 1 of our U.S. Constitution places all, and the lead word is all, legislative powers in the, hands of, in, the power, in the hands of the Congress. That means that all laws are written by the Congress, or in the case of our state, the state legislature. And the same wording is found in our state constitution. U.S. and state constitutions specifically state that only our constitutions are the law of the land. Justification for agency law is always one of efficiency, urgency, or just plain easier. It does take control, it does make control of the people much easier. Some say it's challenging to write laws that require surviving votes of both houses of Congress, a presidential signature, and lawsuits 
before the U.S. Supreme Court, that difficulty was intended by our founding fathers. Now agencies are forced <coughs> the government, writes the laws, and has created its own judiciary. The administrative law judges are appointed and controlled by the agencies that appoint them. And they create their, their own enforcement branches. Agencies have thus become the de facto legislature, king, judge, jury, and enforcer. Uh, but it gets better. With this centralization of power, we now see the blatant practice of selecting which portions of laws the executive or the agencies choose to enforce and which corporations or favored individuals get waivers from the laws. These suspending and dispensing powers are specifically prohibited. Under our constitutions, a legislative act once signed into law by the president or the governor mandates that the executive branch enforce the entire law equally on all people. Presidents Jefferson and Madison both said, should legislative, executive, and judicial powers ever be combined into a single hand, it becomes the very definition of tyranny. Today what we call administrative law is that tyranny. This total remake of our form of government combines the powers of all three agencies under the executive, all three branches. This could only legitimately have become law by amending our Constitution. This never occurred, nor would it likely ever receive voter approval. Having not amended our constitutions to allow it, all administrative law patently violates our Constitution and is therefore illegal. What happened to separation of powers? How has this combination of powers come to be? While well, some enjoy claiming this is merely modernization of government, it in fact has a very long history. Combination of powers was common practice under medieval kings. They issued laws by proclamation. This changed with the signing of the Magna Carta. It gave to ordinary citizens the rights to representative government, to due process, to jury trial by 12 of one's peers, to face one's accuser, protection against self-incrimination, and presumption of innocence until proven guilty. Many English kings tried and repeatedly did destroy these rights through prerogative laws and privy councils. The king's acts were then repeatedly overturned by elected representatives in parliament, three times becoming bloody English civil wars. In 1535, Parliament passed the Prerogative Act and gave King Henry VIII full law, full law writing powers, a close parallel to our Administrative Procedures Acts. Once Parliament realized the danger of giving this much power to the king, they overturned the Prerogative Acts in 1547, shortly after Henry VIII died. Congress began to authorize the existence of agencies in, in 1887. It began with President Cleveland's approval of the Interstate Commerce Act and its agency, the Interstate Commerce Commission. In the 1890s, many Americans and others became enamored with the efficiency of the Prussian model of agency government. 
including one professor, Woodrow Wilson. Other notables, including Vladimir Lenin and Yale Hitler, were students of agency law. You know how those governments turned out. Congress created additional agencies under President Wilson, FDR's New Deal, President Johnson's War on Poverty, President Nixon's establishment of the EPA and OSHA, and even more since then. The agencies on their own now write rules which have gained the force of law. Our Constitution places all legal authority with the judiciary. There's no constitutional legitimacy for judges within agencies. Administrative law judges are agency employees, whether by implication or direction, and with rare exception, they rule in favor of the agency. Under administrative law, you no longer have an independent judiciary. Your right to a jury trial of your peers is prohibited. There's no right to face your accuser. There's no protection against self forced self-incrimination. You're presumed guilty until you can prove your innocence. You're forced to plead guilty prior to or during their quasi-legal proceedings. Your only route of appeal is first through their agency's judiciary. During appeal, the agency is only required to read the government's testimony. And if any justification for guilt is found, they have no responsibility to even read your testimony or acknowledge your evidence. Only after you've exhausted all your administrative remedies and having already been forced to plead guilty in administrative court are you allowed to appear in superior court and appeal to the state and federal courts. To make matters even worse, in the infamous 1984 case, Chevron Incorporated versus National Resources Defense Council, Defense Fund, the US Supreme Court directed lower courts to grant maximum deference to agency decisions. This has become the most widely quoted case in the history of the US Supreme Court. It's no wonder that agencies boast of an 80% success rate in the courts. Combination of powers has become so bold in Washington state that our legislature has repeatedly passed title-only bills. They repeatedly have given the agencies full authority to fill in the law and to levy extorted penalties for noncompliance. There's little or no legislative oversight. <laughs> Congress and the legislature are shielded from criticism. They merely shift the blame to the agencies who wrote the laws. You're like me, I'm a good guy. See, those guys did it. Federal and state agencies both use the power of, extortive, of extortion to force subordinate governments to enact their agendas. They often threaten to withhold grant funds if their bidding isn't followed. These threats have swayed elections right here in Kitsap County. You can better appreciate the power the agencies hold over our county commissioners and our city councils. As an example, before our local elected leaders are allowed to adopt environmental ordinances, such as our critical areas ordinances or our shoreline master plans, Department of Ecology must first approve them. These ordinances directly affect the usefulness and values of our, of our properties. This sham is then called local legislation. 
when it's anything but local. For well aware, agency environmental laws do not require peer-reviewed science. Under agency law, whatever the government determines is science takes precedence. Here are some examples at the federal and state level of problems we face with our executives using prerogative powers. While these examples reflect those now in office, the power is available to all future office holders regardless of political party. During the past two months, with no legislative approval, no legislative authority, our president told agencies to write two new laws. One, the affirmative, affirmatively furthering fair housing and the clean power plan. These will affect each one of us. I could add a lot more to both of those, but in the interest of time, they're in, your, they're in the material I gave you. Our governor having failed to be grant, to granted even a hearing in either house of our, legis of our recent legislature directed the Department, directed the Department of Ecology to draft his cap and trade bill as law. Now it's campaign season. I chuckle when I hear candidates shout, I will do this or that. And the proper phrase is, I'll propose to Congress to do this or that. We seem to be on the road to allowing an elected king to reign. We've now come full circle to Kitsap County's current <coughs> county code, Title 2.116, Civil Enforcement, <coughs> which relates to building, zoning, environmental health and safety, and quality of life. A year ago, a proposed Title V for code enforcement was drafted as a replacement for Title 2.116. Title V was so egregious, it was quickly shelved after citizens rose up in opposition after our last town hall meeting in this very room. Allow me to paraphrase a few sentences from the existing Kitsap County Code 2.116. Subparagraph 040. While in the process of investigating alleged or apparent violations of this chapter, an authorized official, which is a whole pile of different folks, may enter upon any land Note there's no mention of a required warrant issued by a judge prior to entry. This directly violates the judicial warrant prior to access requirement in the 1994 decision of McCready versus the City of Seattle. Subparagraph 060. The person who's been served with the notice of infraction shall sign it. Now, if you're served with a subpoena to appear in superior court, there's no requirement to sign it. It can be thrown at your feet. You've been served. You see here one of the differences between administrative law and constitutional law. Signing the infraction forces you to acknowledge the infraction, which can violate your right against self-incrimination. You can only preserve your rights if you're aware enough to sign by adding the lawyer's signature the phrase under duress. RCW 60, Vice Code of Washington, State Law, RCW 62A 1207. These little cards are out on the table. I strongly suggest that you always carry one in your wallet. That preserves your rights. Otherwise, you give them away. Uh, subparagraph 
B, the same section. The infraction is a non-criminal offense for which imprisonment shall not be imposed as a sanction. Now hold that thought to, to, the, to subparagraphs H and I a little further down. Refusal to sign the infraction, the notice of infraction, or failure to respond to it are misdemeanors and may be punished by a fine or imprisonment in jail. You wonder if people read this before they signed it. How can you be imprisoned for a non criminal offense? Would you be held in jail until you signed the statement of infraction? What should get on a jail free card? Subparagraph 120A. A hearing to determine that an infraction has occurred. Hearing equates to trial in the administrative law parlance. A hearing to determine that an infraction has occurred shall be without a jury. Under our Constitution, all legal proceedings are delegated to the courts. The hearings, in fact, the trial, including the right to call and cross-examine witnesses, uh, and to have a lawyer represent you, and so forth. The prohibition of a jury violates Amendment Number Seven of our U.S. Constitution, which guarantees the right to a jury of one's of, of one's peers. The inviolate right to a jury trial is also found in our state constitution. Those exact words. Often administrative law hearings are done in secret with no access by the public. You think you're in America. The hearing shall be an informal procedure. You can have a formal hearing with a formal court record or an informal hearing without a, without a formal written record. In this case, and in most cases, administrative law judges go to an informal hearing because then there's nobody to look at it. They don't require a verbatim court record. Subparagraph 160, costs are levied on the non-prevailing party. So here we have tort reform, which I believe is yet to be passed by the Congress or the legislature. I consider our county policy on code violations is for the county code enforcement person is only to investigate a neighbor's complaint of an alleged code violation. The case now becomes one of you, the citizen, versus the county. We have today is a scenario which equates to an, an anonymous neighbor's phone call becoming a game of let's watch you and the county fight. What purpose does this all serve when the issue should be a civil suit between the two neighbors, or better yet, a simple discussion. Under Washington State's Constitution, we elect our judges. It's patently unfair for the hearing examiner, who acts as, a, as an administrative law judge, to effectively be an employee of our county commissioners and the Department of Community Development. Is any part of administrative law even legal? A law was passed, but can you pass a law that gives away your basic, your basic job, that of law writing? Our great experiment of government of, by, and for the people seems to be running on the rocks. As you can see, we no longer have control of our government. Our government has control of us, and our constitution is out the window. So what do we do? At the local level, we must demand that our county commissioners make our hearing examiner an elected, impartial judge and demand our rights to due process and to a jury trial. At the state and federal levels, we must lobby our legislators and congresspeople to abolish the Administrative Procedures Act. This would result in all laws once again being voted on by our, our accountable 
elected officials, as our constitutions require. Agency, agencies may still write the rules, but they must put them in the form of a legislative bill in order to get them to become law representatives of the people, must bring them to a vote. The rule of constitutional law is the very glue that holds the fabric of our country together. Without the consistent rule of law, anarchy and social chaos absolutely will prevail. If they're not following their own laws, why should I follow their laws? Is a question asked by many people. The only way to avoid this calamity is to find and support candidates of either party who are committed to enforce our constitutions. If you're that person, run for public office now. The country needs you. So there you have it. We have all of government in bed with the agencies who write laws as directed by the president or the governor or on their own. Congress takes no part and the courts are directed to approve all of it. We've gone full circle to a government that precedes the Magna Carta. Our children aren't taught civics and shortly they won't even recognize that we had guaranteed rights. A couple hundred years ago, our forebears fought a revolution over taxation without representation. Now we have regulation without representation. It's time for another revolution to force our government to behave in accordance with our Constitution. Today we stand in fear of our government. Do we want this for ourselves and for our children and grandchildren? Well, thank you. It's my honor to be with you this afternoon or this evening, and I want to thank every single one of you who took the time to show up tonight, because I can't tell you how important it is. And it's 16 years since this group was started, because that was the first year that you helped me learn that maybe I could make a difference by being an average citizen running for office. Well, let me tell you what, I can affect the law, but I can't do it by myself. But if all of you are behind me, you watch what we can do. When I was a kid, I was in the sixth grade, I remember a quote. You've been asking yourselves what to do. And uh, we talked about there's three types of people. There is the sheep, there is the wolf, and there's the sheepdog wolf. There's another quote. There's the people that, that uh, uh, watch what's happening, the people that ask the question, what's happening, and those that actually do something about it. That's what your job is to be, each and every one of you individually, and the quote I want to remind you of from the sixth grade, a little kid quote, if it is to be, it's up to me. If it is to be, it's up to me. So each one of you that are thinking, realize that that is not an action. Each one of you that has an opinion, that is not an action. Please, now's your time to stand up and actually go create an action. Make something happen and have the input with, with your commissioners. Then you get to change the world.